Okay. So Kara Gwen is here, conscious finance coach. We're just going to go basic at, at the very beginning, which what is conscious finance? It is, I mean, the, the concept of consciousness um, really does play into this, but really it's about focusing on money with the right mind frame. It's mindset. It's seeing money from a different light than maybe the traditional Um and it's, it's using money with intention rather than traditionally money would be considered bad, um, causes people to be greedy, all of these kind of things. But the way I see money is from a conscious light, it's just an energy that feeds what we need to do in life. We cannot avoid it. It in itself is not bad. And when we try to avoid it, that's when problems happen. Whereas if we consciously manage it, consciously approach it, use it with intention, it is a whole other experience. Okay, we're going to come back to that. But I'm curious about your story. How did you come to this? Were you always like this? Um, Unconsciously, I think, <laughs> which is interesting. So um. I, I'm a chartered accountant by trade, so I started very much traditional, you know, I did an accounting and HR degree and um, went to work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, Big Four Firm in Ireland. By chance, you got placed um, into departments at that point. So this was like part of your training and you got assigned to a, a department and I got sign, assigned to the investment management department. In hindsight, very interestingly, because it wouldn't have been something I would have chosen. Um, so I spent eight years auditing some of the biggest investment houses in the world. So I got a real insight into money and investments and how that works. Um, went through my career up to, you know, I'm 14 years in, in UAE now, but the first nine of those, 10 of those were in large multinational companies, one big four firm, and then large multinational companies, regional head of finance, very, very corporate. Um, so can you imagine the language around money in those environments? Um, no, but, tell me, what's it like? I don't know. Well, you know, it's all about the numbers and the bottom line and how much profit we are making and how we can cut costs and how we can control the money and control the finances and control the costs and this fight between the support services and what we are paying for like the accountants and the HR and the IT versus the money making people who are should be more supported and the the issues that cause between them and as a CFO you're you're in between all of that you know you're seeing all sides of all of that um and very 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 kind of I, I would say that masculine energy of money of power we need more we need to be smart with it we need Need to be good with the math with it where are the spreadsheets um, and causing a lot of aggravation so very much that space um in the corporate world but i never really felt that which was probably one of the criticisms i might have just said this morning i might have had in my career is i viewed money in a different way always like I, the feedback i would have gotten is i make i make the finances seem simple i actually make them usable i make them feel like they're it's worth investing and in understanding them and that they actually have a value you know spreadsheets have a value money has a value other than you know in the bank um but wouldn't have ever been aggressive with it so, but how did I end up where I was? You know, I had um, an amazing career from many aspects. I was a woman in a very male dominated profession and industries. Like even the industries I worked with within my profession, extremely male dominated. Um, you know, people consider the Middle East a very male dominated rightly or wrongly but you know there is that perception um as a woman as a mother in finance in these industries i had a very successful career i was extremely well paid in my last job i was surrounded by the most you know and actually in every job to be fair i worked in i was very lucky to be surrounded by extremely influential people supportive people and um, in my last job though i had created that work-life balance we're usually in finance it's very stressful high responsibility a lot of travel at that level um i was traveling to interesting places like iraq and mozambique i was surrounded by you know amazing people that were really inspir inspiring that i learned a lot from I I was re very well paid, great work-life balance, and I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, mm, there's something, there's something here. So, in at the end of 2019, early 2020, before I knew the word COVID, um, decided that it was time to figure out what it is that I wanted to do. Um, 
and that's where my my business came about because what I did is I, I I looked at what am I good at what do I care about um but I also did not want to give a 20 de- 20 decades 20 years two decades of study you know blood sweat and tears experience didn't want to just walk away from that it's like how can I incorporate that into something that's important to me and that's where the whole money piece came up because I looked at a big part of obviously moving from corporate into working to your, working for yourself is can I afford this you know what is this going to do for me financially I was um the main breadwinner in our household I have three young children I have responsibility the money piece came up and it was co- kind of interesting that as that came up I started realizing there is a real gap here for people who want to understand money more and um, who feel trapped by money be it the the golden handcuffs as they call it with the good salaries or the responsibility um, and it all kind of just came together and I started doing research I took some time you know away and looked at it and went ah you know if I am the accountant with the investment management experience with the CFO experience, with all of these things, and I love spreadsheets and I love numbers and maths was my favorite subject at school and accounting, you know, when I got that to balance, I got a real kick out of it. And if I'm struggling, like what must people who don't, you know, they say that, that that's the, the combination that, you know, will help people to be good with money. Um, and I started talking to people, especially women, about money and how they felt about it. When I realized there's a real gap in the market here, um, and then that's when basically my business evolved and I did a lot of research and I did some trainings um, and I looked at my experience with money and how I, you know, 10 years before, probably 10, 15 years before had gone through that process of like, well, how do I invest? What do I do with my money? How much should I be spending on this? How do I release in hindsight my scarcity mindset um, and build a business around it? To, because I felt that money has been made the root of all evil when in actual fact, money in itself is nothing. In it's as I said like recently, it's not even we don't even see it anymore. You know, we rarely see cash, and and even you know we tap our phones, but now we're even you know paying for things with our faces. So it's becoming less and less actually physically in our existence, um, but yet it it does have play a part in pretty much every decision we make. So. The more I looked into the stress around money, how we talk about money, the isolation women feel around money, um, the more, you know, I felt passionate that this is something that I can help people with, given my own experience with my skill set. Um, yeah. And then that's where conscious finance coaching has evolved from. OK, so you mentioned the scarcity mindset and some of mm. the messaging that we have about money. What is it we're hearing and what do many of us believe about money that just isn't true that holds us back? Yeah. I mean, the most common things I hear are um, I feel stupid when it comes to money. Um, It's for other people. You know, it's just too complicated for me. Um, I just let him do it because I I can't deal with numbers. Um, It's all a scam. Um, Money brings out the worst in people. Um, I don't want to be greedy. It, I mean, when people say, look, I just want to, I, 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 I want to get out of debt and, but I don't want to be greedy. I'm like, I'm not looking to be really wealthy here, you know, and there's that, that, that apology immediately. I'm not, I'm not going to be greedy. You know, don't judge me. There's so much judgment around money. Yeah. Um, to be wealthy means you're a bad person. You, what, what have you done to gain that wealth? To want wealth must mean you're greedy and you you've got the wrong value system, um, that it will corrupt you is a very common one. People are actually scared to be wealthy because, which is always, yeah, an interesting reaction. People are like, how could you be scared to be wealthy? Because they're scared of that it will make them a bad person or that they will lose friendships or that they will lose family members. Um, There are so many limiting beliefs around money that money can't buy happiness. Um, And then the flip side of that is that money will bring unhappiness more you have the more more worries you have and um, more money more problems um and and and, and they all it's interesting so many people in opposite and there's so many some people will say if i had more money my problems will be solved a person sitting beside them might say oh just no no god no more money more problems i used to say that um i used to think that when i look back you know 
and we talk in Ireland about the lotto and uh, oh, winning the lotto. You know, we always talk about, oh, I just won the lotto. And then you'd have these philosophical conversations around, you know, if you won this much, what would you do? If you won this, how much would you want? How much is enough? Yep. And I used to say, um, no, 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 I only want no more than like 11 million would be, I remember saying 11 million would be a good number because that way I could do this, this and this and I could help this family member and that family member and I just have enough then and I'd still have to work so I wouldn't feel like it's too much responsibility and I wouldn't, you know, I'd still stay grounded. And I look back now and I mean, it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the more you have, the more you can do, you yeah. know, and it's not about, you know, but I lived in fear of being different, losing family members, not being able people to be able to relate to me, be seen to be greedy. And then the responsibility, what would I do with that much money? That's scary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So many limiting. And then someone else would say, no, 150 million wouldn't be enough because, um, you know, I want to solve all these problems. It's so individualistic. It really, really is. Um, and no one carries just one. It's multifaceted. That's crazy. And what kinds of things did these beliefs cause us to do that hurt us? Mm. So what I see, I've seen people <clears throat> reject money, um, live, in, live in restriction unnecessarily, Um I can give you examples. I, I know I had one client who um, every time, self-sabotage, every time she progressed in her career to a certain level where she held responsibility for um, money within the business, like a P&L, let's say, she quit, changed industry and started again. Wow. Yeah, because she had this fear of the responsibility of money. Um, a lot of my clients will come to me and say, I have an abundance mindset. I know I have an abundance mindset. This is not a mindset issue because, you know, I know money will come. I don't sit in fear of it. You know, I'm not attached to money. Um, you know, sometimes they'll laugh and they'll say, you know, my, my, my rent was due a month ago and two weeks before I didn't have it. I didn't have it. I didn't know how I was going to pay it, but I trusted that we will come and something happens and the money magically appears, right? Whether, you know, however that form that takes. But I never have money in my bank account. Mm. I never have money. It, I'm, not, I'm not in debt, but I've no security around it. And that is the manifestation, really, of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to attract it. Money can flow, but I'm afraid of having it. I'm afraid of the responsibility, maybe, of how to invest it. I don't want... And, and, and we live in... Um, our comfort zones. So if we grew up sometimes in that case of, like, not having money... Our, our our comfort zone is living in that space of constantly like, oh, what's next? How am I going to do it? And when we step outside that, it's actually, even though in theory it's an easier life, it's quite scary because we don't know what to do with it. So we sabotage that. Um, we we attract ways that the money just goes or we just spend it. Um, I have, I've seen people who, you know, that me, for example, scarcity mindset played out massively in like my early years. So I saved, 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 saved. Terrified that my job would go and what would I do? Because I can't get this again. For me, it was always like this opportunity, like I'm so lucky, I'm so lucky. I'm living in that space of gratitude, but also I suppose um, imposter syndrome of like, I'll never get this again. And therefore I must save, 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 but saved and had no idea or really um, confidence in how to invest it to make it grow um, and didn't enjoy it. So I didn't enjoy it. And, and it was actually quite trapping, which might sound a bit odd. Um, there's so many ways it plays out where we self-sabotage largely. That's why, you know, they say a lot of, um, I think it's something like only 3% or 2% of millionaires still have the money like two to three years later. Right, right. Because we, our mindsets aren't able to handle that level of wealth unless we have done the work and cleared it and we just find ways to get rid of it. And a lot of us came out here and connected with financial companies that were not uh, mm. good mm. or operated operated on this premise of a scarcity mindset and fear. So fear. experience, yeah. yeah, fear. If fear is a tactic to get you to sign up for schemes and that sort of thing. So, do you see people who were sucked into that as well? Oh my god, yes. Fear. It's one of my biggest frustrations. Um, and um, annoyances with the financial industry. I mean, it's not just the financial industry who sales based on fear. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're very good at is seeming like they know what they're talking about, 
So very good salespeople saying the right things, being very confident, presenting themselves in that space of don't you worry, I know. But if you don't do this, this is the world of trouble you're going to be in. Um, Yeah, it's a huge problem. It's a really, really huge problem because they're not operating in the interest of the individual. And what happens is naturally, I mean, it's not a criticism of the person who signs up for these these policies and um, programs. They are very convincing. And they are legitimate. You know, they're, they're not frauds. They are legitimate. They're just extremely expensive. And that's what's not explained to people. They are set up for the benefit of the investment advisor and the investment management company. There is little to no benefit for the person whose money is actually going into these programs because of the costs. They're mm. just extremely extremely expensive um and it is really difficult you know my role i do see people who who invest a lot of money in these and it's just not the best use of their money it's really not and and they feel they feel betrayed because a lot of the financial advisors that they tell me about you know they befriend them they they really they really play to their emotions and they feed into that space of look you don't know about this i do so they've made the person a vulnerable situation and they've completely taken advantage of that um and it's and it's yeah it's it's sad actually it really really is sad like because it's taken it's taken advantage of people um in a really unethical way okay so when you start to realize that oh i've got money stuff and almost everyone has money stuff how do you what steps should a person take whether they're out of control whether they're in debt whether they're holding on to their money what sort of steps do you advise for them to become more conscious towards abundance Clarity. I constantly say money loves clarity. The more clarity we have, it's like anything in life, right? The more clarity we have in a situation and ourselves and how we behave in a situation, um, the more we can do to to shift anything that we need to shift to improve. Um, There's two, for me, with money, there's two pillars. There's mindset and then there's the tools and the financial literacy and the practical side of it. They, one without the other, you're not, you know, like the foundation is going to be wobbly. Um, if you are, and there's very, I mean, it, it's a very broad question because, you know, needing to improve with money can be many things. Is it, do you have a scarcity mindset and believe that, you know, you're not worthy of great wealth, therefore you won't go for the higher paid jobs. You won't go for the promotions because you just don't think that I could, I could ever earn that kind of money. Are you someone who um, has a lot of debt Um and I'm not facing up to that debt and it's spiraling out of control. You know, they're two different things. I mean, but there's mindset in both and then there's practical in both. So what I would first do is look at what is your financial situation? Really like get the financial clarity around what is your income? What are you spending every month? No ifs, buts, maybes. Don't do it in your head. Take out a spreadsheet, take out an app, take out a piece of paper if you need to, but look at your bank statements, go to your bank statements because they are your truth. You know, we can't run spreadsheets in our brains. I say that constantly. Most people can tell me, you know, my rent is this, my groceries are this. I spend about this on X, Y, Z, the big ticket numbers. But yet money just seems to fall through my hands. I don't know where it goes because there's so many small things. There's so many automations there, subscriptions and, you know, things that come out of our bank account that we don't even think about. Um, And the tapping that we do on every day, just as part of life. So really just take the time to analyze it, understand that your spending habits, get that reality check. Okay. Most times it's not as bad as you think. And then be very aware of your mindset as you're doing it. It's a really powerful exercise to, you know, if you're conscious of your thoughts as you're doing that exercise. First of all, what do you feel when I say to you, let's get your bank statements out and have a look at them? What do, most, be- <laughs> yeah. what do most people feel? Do they panic? <laughs> yeah. No, oh, yeah, yeah, very vulnerable place. Um, and it can be a mix of they're scared of what I'll see and the judgment I'll have of them. But very often it's their own self-judgment because I'm like, I'm, I, I'm terrified of what I'm going to see for myself and yeah. the regret, and the shame and the anxiety and what that brings up for people because they, everyone thinks that they could have done more with their money than they did and they don't want to face that reality. Um, but it's a really powerful exercise. But in that space of clarity, not judgment, no should-haves, could-haves, would-haves, awareness, yeah. just awareness. Take away that weight of, <gasps> look at all these mistakes I made. This is not about that. It's about looking at, okay, now I need to face up to the truth. It's like looking yourself in the mirror, right? Who do I want to be? How have I been behaving? How have I been behaving with my money? And it will give you an insight into your life. You know, people often say to me, God, Carol, this is, um, 
you really have a full view now into my lifestyle and who I am because it's all played out in the numbers. Okay. Um, but yeah, most people are, I mean, it's why they come to me because they're, they're scared to do it. They're terrified of what they're going to see. And what a lot of people say is even if I do it myself, then I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. I see it. And now what? Now I just feel crappy about myself. Um, what do I do now? And then, you know, it's about then using that information to um, make the changes, to look at your mindset, to, you know, just make more conscious choices with your money now that you're aware of your financial situation. So you said it's very common that people are like, I could have done more. I should have done more. That's like mm. a grieving process sort of. Do you see people going through that? Do you have any advice for getting over that hump of regret? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of forgiveness work in this, you know, forgiving yourself, forgiving others. Um, sometimes it can even be like forgiving your parents for, you know, for whatever happened in their financial life that then played out with you. Um, cause we inherit a lot of our mindset and our habits from our childhood. Um, yeah, it, it's, and you know, one of the, one of the most common pieces of feedback I get from clients is, I help them feel safe to face the reality and release it. And I always find it interesting that they felt safe to do that because it is a very vulnerable place. It is a very um, difficult place to be if you look at your finances and see what you perceive as a lot of mistakes and could haves and should haves and what ifs. But shame is the most debilitating, you know, emotion we can carry it doesn't help us. So my advice would be to, you know, like all emotions, really, just sit with it, understand it, feel it, but let it go because it's not going to move you forward. Learn from it. If there's something happening happening from the past that it's in your control and you don't like what you see, now you know. Because very often we don't even know or we live in fear of what it might be. Now you know. So now you have the awareness, let's make the change um, and move forward and just move forward from there because we can't change the past, but we can learn from it. And, you know, I try and encourage people to, to use it as a lesson, you know, that none of us, none of us were born with the financial playbook, although everyone seems to think everybody else is, you know, everybody else knows how to do this with money, but how come I don't? No one does. No one, we all figure it out. Some of us, you know, have maybe better teachers than our parents or we were taught at school although very very few and um, some learn early some learn later like any life skill the way i see it is look we don't know until we know and once we know then we can start looking forward so take that approach and um, it's a life lesson if, if there was mis mistakes in the past and especially with debt you know debt can be very shame inducing and anxiety and it's actually quite dangerous um especially for men who have debt that they feel they can't get out of that can be an extremely toxic and dangerous place for them to be as we've seen some of the really tragic you know outcomes of that because if they don't feel they have a space to get help that can escalate um but from my experience the vast majority of debt that people have is is not true intentional mismanagement of money it's it's circumstance or it's just not having the right skills or not being aware of the consequences of the decisions that they're making because they were young or you know i've seen a lot of people with debt after covid and they're carrying so much shame around that and the way i help them to release that is say well let's, let's see what was the purpose of this How, why did you have that debt one example that comes to mind is um a family who had a lot of debt because they had to pay their rent on their credit card because they hadn't he lost his job she had no job he lost his job they have they have children they couldn't just leave um they needed to pay their rent so the way I look at that is like, do you know what? We can actually be grateful for this debt because the existence of it meant your family had a home. But now let's release it. Say, thank you, but you're not serving me anymore. Bye. Let's work on a plan to get rid of it. But rather than sitting in the, oh, I'm so, I, you know, I'm so resentful of this debt. Actually, aren't you lucky in one sense? You had the ability to pay your rent and this is how you did it. Not the way you want it to be. But flipping that mindset, that, that kind of view of it, the perspective of it, and then say, okay, but now I don't need it anymore. I have a job. I'm going to pay this off and I'm learning from the situation. Now in future, I will have maybe an emergency fund that if that ever happened again, I learn from it. That's taken care of while I figure out. Um, so looking for the lessons. What are your top, you know, what are your top cost cutting tips from seeing all these people, like concrete things? Because I'm sick of, 
reading about how you don't go to Starbucks and, you know, like I've been reading <laughs> tips. If I hear the latte factor one more time, you know, uh, yeah. what are yeah. some act really actionable things that you've seen people do to get out of debt or to um, increase their savings or ability to invest? Yeah, I often use the, the Starbucks thing as a, or like the coffee thing. It's such, again, it's a shaming tool, isn't it? Oh, you're so indulgent. You're so irresponsible. It's just shaming people um, unnecessarily because, you know, saving that $5 a day is going to do what exactly? Um, it's not on, it's, it's ridiculous. But that aside, if, if, if you're in a situation where, you know, you're living paycheck to paycheck and, um, you need to cut costs because, you know, people often ask me, like, how do I reduce my expenses? I need to reduce my expenses. And I'll say, well, let's take let I'll say, let's take a step back because maybe you don't need to. You know, maybe this is an income issue. You know, why do we always go to there must be a problem with your spending? Mm -hmm. Now, maybe there is, but we I don't ever assume that. So, again, it's back to that clarity. Let's first look at what your income is what your expenditure is per month, ideally for six months. There is so much information in those numbers. First thing we look at, your value system. Where are we seeing in these expenses that you are spending money on th something that is simply not important to you? Because that's what a lot of wasteful spending is. It's not what you're spending on. You know, I might not enjoy coffee and don't understand why anyone could spend $5 on a coffee, for example. And to me, that's wasteful. Someone else might say, you know, I just really enjoyed for me, like, for example, how this coffee thing came up for me was when I was working in um, in the DISC, very high stress job, sitting in my office, very isolating as a CFO. It can be a very lonely place. Um, and I just wanted to get out. So at 11 o'clock every day, I'd walk down and have a nice coffee and I'd sit there and I might talk to the barista, I might meet a friend or I might sit by myself and I'd sit and enjoy my coffee. That's worth $5 to me or whatever amount it is every day. You know what I mean? That's what that gave me back is worth more than that five dollars i got fresh air i got a break from the office i had a nice conversation i got time to myself maybe whatever that might be and i went back to the office refreshed that's the way i look at it so you look at your expenses with that view what am i spending here that's actually helping me giving back in line with my values pushing me towards what it is i want to do in my life and what's not so if you want to cut expenditure look at the ones that aren't feeding you in the sense of your value system because they're easy to let go right you can look at them and go i don't care Whatever. You know, families will say to me, um, especially here in the UAE, where it's, you know, it, it's a it's very strong part of our culture to eat out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is, you know, as as expats, it's connection, it's community, it's how we spend time with people. And um, sometimes we just enjoy it in some cultures. It's, it's just a big part of their culture to share food together. That's it. Um, so very often I see and when I do this analysis of people's finances that eating out tends to be a, a larger number here than maybe in, in other locations. Um, and two, again, again, and that's a good example. Two ways to look at that is one. I mean, I have so many examples of these, like one family will say that is our social life. That is our connection. That is a high priority want. It's not a need. It's a high priority want for us. Another family will go, wow, we've no idea, actually. I have one family who said, oh, it's probably, you know, around maximum 3000 a month, maximum, maximum. We don't eat out often. We never go out. They're looking at each other a couple. We never go out like it couldn't be. And it was 6000 a month. And they were horrified because they were thinking we never go out for the nice meals at nighttime, you know, date night or whatever. But it's the breakfast. It's the lunches. It's it's the coffees. You know, it's it, we're out shopping. Let's just stop for a sandwich. It's all of these things pulled together. And they're like, oh, wow, actually, that's not important to us. We'll happily not that. A lot of that is convenience. Yeah. No, we're, you know, we'll make the changes because we've seen the impact of it. That's the most impactful and fastest way to do it. Okay. Now, if you do that and you're still saying, oh, actually, maybe because I have debt, it's still very, very tight. Then, of course, the next layer up is to go, right, well, is there anything that you can, let's say, restrict, reduce, remove, or adjust so that, you know, we can argue for, you know, a reduction in certain subscriptions or a cancel subscription or, you know, rather than going out twice a month, go out once a month, you know, where can you reduce? But what's important there is because um, we want this to be sustainable. It needs a purpose to do that. Why are you doing that? Because if, if this is a normal part of your life and you're going to stop it, you're going to quickly start to resent that. And we're not going to stick to it. It's like being put on a, a money diet. You need a reason why. Why am I doing this? Because if I save that $500 a month by doing this, and it's going to be tough maybe for six months, you know, I'll miss out on a few things. I won't travel, whatever that might be. 
but what's it giving me? Mm. I can put that towards my debt and in six months, one year, whatever, you know, work out the numbers, exactly what it is. At that point in time, at that date, I will be debt free. That money will be mine. I'll have extra money every month and I'll be debt free. And that's your purpose. So when things get harder and you're living in that space of maybe a restriction for a period of time, you have one and end days to it and two, you have the real purpose. And then think about what am I going to do when I'm out of debt? What am I going to do with that 500 when I'm out of debt? So keep that in mind so that you can get through that maybe difficult time. And then the next piece is income. No one ever thinks to look at income when I, when we work together. They're always like, let's look at my expenses. And I say, okay, well, let's look at your income as well. You know, is there, because where are, where, you know, energy goes where our intention is, right? So, the, and, and actually, I do believe in energy around these things. The more we focus on something, the more it grows. So we don't want to focus too much on expenses because we yeah. don't want them to keep growing. Um, huh? And living in that space of lack, if you're living in that lack mentality, you're going to attract more lack, which probably, which is where the abundance men- mindset individuals say, oh, but there's always expenses. And no matter how much I take in, there's always expenses because you, you've told yourself there's always going to be expenses to absorb this money. So no matter what I do, one is going to do the other. But what you want to do is look at how can I attract mo- even more than I need? That's another actually interesting. Sorry, I know I'm going on a lot now. I but love that's it. Another, <laughs> there's another interesting actually um, um, piece when it comes to the abundance mindset is, I like again, back to not being greedy, but like I only ever have as much as I need. That's enough. L- women, women will constantly say to me now, I just, I just want to have enough. It's all I want. So I'm not struggling. I just want enough. Yeah, <laughs> your face. <laughs> Whereas and be my face. I'm like, why not more? Yeah. Why not? Oh, I don't want to be greedy. I don't want to take from anybody else. You're not taking from anyone else. Yeah. Actually, the more you have, the more you can give to other people if that's you know important to you. But women will constantly say to me, you know, their limiting beliefs. I just want enough. That enough is enough. It's okay for me. But this yeah, is- looking at income, looking at growing income is really important too. Okay, so having a part-time job or getting a new job or a side hustle or something like that or being opening to have open to have more oh don't okay. limit yourself okay. as well yeah so um and even side hustle i i, I you know hustle you know, language is so important um having a, a separate income a, a, a new income an additional income um is where i would look at that because hustle feels hard doesn't it it's yeah. like, oh, i'm struggling i'm hustling first it's going to be hard to do it um, how can I create another income? How can I, you know, even be open to a salary increase? Because sometimes we limit ourselves. We say, no, that's me. Um, is there something, and, and it could be an investment to get there. You know, where are you in your career? Do you want to progress? What do you need to get there? All oh, I need to do a training course. Right, well, let's look at your expenses. Maybe you save a little bit less for a period of time to invest in the training course that you need to do to get to where you want to be in your career so that you can then have more income. Um in the longer term. So looking at, you know, not, not tapping yourself with how much income you can have, be that true, you know, other, other income sources or even within your own career, how you can progress. Um, okay. So this is like a huge shift for a lot of people. What resources Mm. would you recommend to start being around this kind of thinking? Because chances are in most people's social circles, they don't hear this. So what no, books it's not can, talked about. No, it's not. What books can they read and use? Um, there's a lot of great books out there. Um, so there's one that I recommend a lot. It's very female focused and female entrepreneur focused as well, but I, it absolutely is applicable to even if you are in a salary, you know, if you're in employment, not just not self-employed, is um Denise Duffield Thomas does a lot of money mindset work and her book that I recommend is Get Rich, Lucky Bitch, if I can say that on here. Um, Another one is um, You Are a Badass at Making Money. These are specifically mindset books Um, by, is it Jill Sincero? Jen Jen Sincero. Jen Jen Sincero. They're, They're a great, easy to digest, inspiring first introduction to money mindset and looking at it in a different way. Um, they would be my first two if this is your 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 first. I mean, there, there's broader ones. You know, we all know the typical ones like Rich Dad, Poor Dad for understanding assets and, and liabilities and um, Think and Grow Rich um, The Secrets of a Millionaire Mindset. They're 
if you think more of the kind of masculine focus, um, it's all applies to male and females, but, you know, we sometimes get an initial point can relate to one more than the other. Um, they're all great books as well. When it comes to financial literacy, um, and this is where I focus heavily, I don't have my own book yet that I can recommend yet, but it, it is about finding, to be honest, get just first point is do that, what I call financial clarity, do that review. What are your expenses for six months? Understand it. Be vulnerable with yourself sometimes, you know, just being like, okay, this is, you know, this is what's happening. What do I like? What do I not like? And then take it from there. And then be conscious, plan. You know, I don't believe in in restriction. Um, I think restriction breeds restriction, you know, and people often ask me, should I use a budgeting tool, for example, to track all of my spending every day? Um, only if you enjoy it would be my answer if you and some people do some people love it you know they get a real sense of satisfaction but there's a control element there yeah. um they love it and for a period of time and it gives them a lot of awareness you know i think that it is about being the more conscious we are with our spending every time we spend just have a moment stop and think you know either it's gratitude for the fact that you can do it i have the money to purchase this whatever that might be to do this activity to buy this thing whatever that might be or also that moment of why am I doing this? That awareness of, is this an emotional reaction? Am I shopping because I'm feeling sad or frustrated or annoyed or because I hate my job and I have no joy in my life, so I'm going to buy myself something nice because I want to feel better? Um, why? Why? And then another t another tip here that can help people if they feel find themselves sitting in that space, that reactive spending, and then they're shaming themselves for it. Why did I do that? Such a waste of money. See, I'm bad with money. I'm clueless. Um and it sits in the wardrobe for maybe six weeks before we even use it because it just makes us feel bad about ourselves every time we look at it. Um, we've all been there is also a moment to kind of that is to understand one. Oh, this is happening. Awareness mindset. Why am I thinking like this? What's led me to this moment? But even in that moment is, is this going to back to our value system? Is this going to help me in the long run? You know, if I don't buy this thing. OK, I might not get the adrenaline hit that I wanted or the sense of relief that I wanted in that moment. But maybe I can put this money to my debt and that will give me a longer term um, benefit trade off. What's more important to me right now? And it can help in the short term, at least to um, kind of stop maybe some of those negative habits that are having a financial impact on us and help move towards. OK, well, actually, now I have more awareness. I did this when I was feeling in this way. Hmm and then do some work on that. That's amazing, Carol. And you're, you do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if people are interested in hiring you, they can contact you. I'll put all your information yes. in the show notes. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's always a breath of fresh air to speak to you about this stuff. You've helped me a lot personally, so I can highly recommend you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'd say, uh, as you know, I love talking about this a lot. So thank you for having me on. Um, and yeah, we talk for hours. <laughs>